Good to be together, good to host you today. My name is Gareth, and uh, hey, just wanted to take a moment before we get into the message for today to uh, give a special shout out to a few people, nine in fact, who have decided to become partners here in the Free Church story. So the pictures are going to come up on screen, and some of them are in here in the room, and some are coming to the second service. So Yaku and Mareka, uh, France and Nishani, Brian, Way, Jenny, Tuli, and Catherine. And what becoming a partner here at Free Church means is that they're making a decision to see church as a hotel, which is very transactional, kind of in and out and on your way to somewhere else, uh, to actually make this place home. And uh, some of them are already in life groups, some of them already joined the dream team, some of them are uh, taking a next step in their faith journey today, so we're excited about that. So if you are any of those people on the screen, won't you just uh, wave your hands at me, I see some of you over there, there's Brian over here. And come on, Jenny's the back there. So if you're around them, just give them a, give them a, a high five. And uh, I'm going to take a, a moment to pray for you guys. So if I could ask you if you're comfortable, we're, uh, just uh, let's take a moment. Let's pray together. Close your eyes. And uh, God, I just want to give you glory and honor and thanks that you are building your church, that you are adding people into this local church. And I pray that the journey ahead will be one of, of great relationships, of restoration to purpose, of settling in core identity experiencing the incredible value that you place upon every single one of these people. And uh, may there be incredible stories and testimonies to come as you use them to bring your kingdom into this city of Centurion. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Hey, well, you made it through Black Friday. You're still here. Anyone got any money left? Cyber Monday is still coming. It's a crazy time of year, right? I was doing some reading this week about the origins of Black Friday, and some of you might have read a bit about it, and there's various stories of how it came about, but the one that seems to be the most prominent or the most truthful was back in the 1950s in the city of Philadelphia in the U.S., Uh, there was Thanksgiving took place, and then crowds descended upon the city into all the stores in anticipation of a game that was going to happen, a football game between the Navy and the Army. And because of all these crowds that came into the the city, there was just chaos in all the shops. Uh, The police actually called it Black Friday because they had to work extended shifts. They had to do extra traffic control. And people in the shops, some of them were shoplifters, so they took advantage of all the chaos and crowds, and there was a a lot of looting uh, that went on. So this day became known as Black Friday. And it was only 30 years later that the marketeers began to redevelop and put a positive spin on it and use the story of how this is the moment when stores go from being in the red to being in the black. So about profitability. And this is where the idea of Black Friday comes from. And uh, I, I was thinking about how words change over time. And here's a word. I don't know if this one is or or awe. You, you decide. Awe. <laughs> Let let me tell you a little bit about the word awe. So in times of old, the word awe means filled with terror and dread. And then it became known as a a reverence. If you're in awe of something, you have reverence for it. And in fact, today we have two words which derive their origin out of this word. You can think of them. You guys are clever people. The one is awesome. And the other one is awful, right? And the one means awesome. And the other one means awful, both from the same word. And in fact, the original meaning of the word awful was actually something that you're in wonder, in awe of something, in reverence of something. It didn't mean horrible and terrible, but over time it's, it's changed. Here's another one, uh, the word bet, bet. When I was growing up, this was like, a, you would say, uh, bet as kind of a, you know, a reinforcement of the point you were trying to make. So you say, uh, I'm going to Cape Town this holiday, and someone would say to you, you want to bet? You want to bet? Like, are you actually, in other words, questioning, like the statement that you made, and say, oh, I bet you this is going to happen. It's like this element of truth. But today, it means like uh, it's a positive reinforcement agreement. It's like, we're getting pizza for dinner, bet. We're going to church today, bet. So it's like now it's this affirmation. It doesn't mean what it used to mean. Um, here's another one, cancelled. Oh, cancel culture. Everyone knows what this means, right? It, this used to mean like the, the cricket match has been cancelled. It's no longer taking place. But now cancelled is used in, in the context of when an organization or, or a company is involved in some kind of ethical 
um, or unethical behavior or using uh, maybe child labor to manufacture their, their products, and then a person would say, they are canceled in my books. In other words, I'm boycotting them, I'm uh, not supporting them any longer. What about this one? Drip. Does anyone remember this from, like, this is a throwback to a long time ago. That person is such a drip. That person is such a drip. Very negative. Now it's like, whoa, your shoes are dripping. <laughs> By the way, best seats in the house these days, front right, right in front of the aircon, and also back left over there. It's where the new aircons are. Like, everyone, suddenly this section of the room is full. <laughs> uh, here's another one. Goats. When I was growing up, this used to mean a, <laughs> a goat. Now it means something else, the greatest of all time. Who is that? We'll leave that to you. Uh, here's another one. Slaps. Slaps. Slaps usually spoke about like violence. You're going to get a slap. Now, it's, now you use the word slaps when something is really good. Like church slaps. <laughs> right? Could, the fair statement? Can we say that? Free church slaps. Yes. All right. Here's another one. Christmas. Christmas. What do you think when you hear the word Christmas? Food. Presents. Family. Oh, family. Oh. <laughs> some, some of us, right? It's like, oh my goodness, this time of the year again. Uh, money, uh, festivities, trees, lights, um, chaos. It's the silly season. It's a difficult time of year to get anything done. Often we'll say, like, this is a really chaotic time of year. Um, so Christmas, and, and somewhere in there, it's, oh yes, it's Jesus' birthday, right? Usually not the, the first thought that comes into our minds, or at least in the, in the minds of culture. It's, yes, it has something to do with Jesus and the nativity scene and, and angels singing and all those kind of things. But in fact, where did Christmas come from? Like the root word. So think about where words come from. So Christmas originally is made up of two words. The first one is the word Christ. So Christ means uh, the, the Messiah or God's anointed king, the chosen one, all right? So it's the word Christ in the New Testament, not Jesus' surname, as we often remind you, but actually his, his position as God's anointed king. It, it, the Hebrew word is Messiah, God's anointed king. This is the word Christ. And then mass comes from a 1,000 years ago in the Roman Catholic Church when people would come together and at the end of the service, they would, they would say these words in Latin, ite messe est, which means you are sent, go. So the word mass comes from missa in the middle of that. So you could think of the word Christmas like this. God's anointed king is sending you to go. Isn't that a little bit of a different take on the word Christmas? Instead of festivities and let's get together and exchange presents and gifts and all those kind of things can be good and fun, but actually the root of this word, where it comes from. I mean, think of this. Every time you see the word Christmas, every, every time you speak the word Christmas, it's a reminder to you that God's anointed king sends you to go and do something. I mean, God's anointed king, the king of the universe has a mission and a purpose for you. So every time you hear this word Christmas, that's a reminder to you that God has a plan and a purpose for, you, for your life and your life and your life and your life. And he says to you, I'm sending you go Christmas. So it's December, Christmas series time. So what we did is went to the Christmas stories in the pages of Scripture. And there's only two places that you can find him. It's in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. And together, we form out of those the Christmas narrative or the nativity story or the advent. And uh, we began to read through them. But i got to warn you, I didn't get very far before I was interrupted. So we're not even going to get into anything really to do with Christmas today unless it's to do with the fact that God's anointed king sends you. So we're going to go to Luke. And Luke is... One of the first books in the New Testament of the Bible, and uh, it was written by a medical doctor. And Luke wasn't one of Jesus' disciples. He wasn't one of the close 12, but he uh, spent a lot of time with Paul, who wrote much of the New Testament. And he went around and he interviewed people that had been with Jesus and hung out with Jesus, and he gathered information and he put this gospel together for a specific purpose. And the first three verses of the book of Luke explain what that is for. So if you have a Bible with you, we're going to turn there together, and it's going to come up on the screen, and I will read to you just a couple of verses out of the book of Luke. So, Luke chapter 1, 
verse 1. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So with this in mind, in other words, there's a lot of information out there, there's a lot of uh, things being said, there's a, a lot of written reports. So with this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus. So Luke is writing this as a letter where he's gathered all this detail, all these information, he's sifted through the facts, he's interviewed people, and he's put this account together, and he's, he's writing it to a person called Theophilus. And this is what he says in verse 4, so that you may know the certainty of the things that you've been taught. And as I read through that, I was arrested and stopped, and I had this thought, there's many things that you and I have been taught about Jesus. There's, there's many things that you and I may know about the Bible. There's many things that we've learned perhaps in Sunday school or on social media. There's many things that we've been taught. But of those things, of how many of them are you certain? So we have these vague ideas about what Christmas is about and how it works and how it fits together and what implication it has on your life today. But what are the things that you know for certain? Because here's the truth, is where there's uncertainty, there's chaos. When you have uncertainty in your life, and I mean when you have uncertainty in the depths of your heart, your heart becomes chaotic and your thoughts become chaotic. Your life becomes chaotic. But when you have certainty, even though there's chaos going around, uh, happening around you, when you have certainty in the depths of your soul, in that place you can find peace in the midst of chaos. I remember some years ago we were down in KZN and we were on holiday in Belito, and uh, we try to get away there June, July, every year. It's like our family rhythm. And uh, this year happened to be the year when KZN exploded into the riots. Some of you remember that? It was all over the news. Some of you might have been down there. Um, and it, it was just this like tumultuous, chaotic time. So we were away from home with our kids, and uh, things began to unfold and, and develop, and suddenly the little holiday town where we were staying became locked down, and um, we were wondering, like, what is going to happen? Three young kids with us in a small flat, stuck inside, and no real connection with family close to us. So all we wanted to do is just, like, get back home, get out of there, but the roads were closed. In fact, uh, the people, the residents that lived in Belito had closed the town down, so all the people who used to be in the army came out, and all those who had dreams of perhaps being in the army one day also <laughs> came out and produced, like, waving all these firearms around, like, where did these people get all these guns, right? And they, they wouldn't let you out, they wouldn't let anyone back in, and it was like this military rule um, that were happening within the town, and then all the shops closed, and we only had a limited supply of food, so I went and I stood in the queue at the local spa, because they said they're going to open it for a few hours, for, I think, what was it, Amy, three days, uh, eight hours in a row for three days, and eventually, after three days of queuing, eventually got in, and you could buy, like, random things, and just, like, one of each, you could buy 11 items, and only one of each thing, and you, so you had to be really specific, so Amy gave me a very detailed <laughs> shopping list, get these 11 things, if you can get them. And uh, there was all this uncertainty. We, did, we had no idea when it was going to end. Our kids were, like, grappling with this, what they're seeing and hearing. And uh, here's the thing is we couldn't find any certainty. We were following uh, along on Twitter, trying to figure out what's happening. We are reading the news reports. We are trying to, you know, sift through WhatsApp messages and find out what was happening until we got one message, which was from the guys up at Link Church in Belito, which are, are friends of ours. And they said, hey, if you need anything, we've got food. Just come up to the church and we'll, we'll sort you out. And it was like in the midst of this chaos, suddenly there was certainty. There was a message from a trustworthy source, like we know these people. So I took a drive up to Link Church and they gave us a, a bunch of groceries and all those kind of things. And in the conversation with them, they said, this is the place where you can get fuel because all the garages were shut. But they said, if you go here, you can get fuel. And if at this time on this day, the roads will be open, you can get through. So suddenly it was like a, from a reliable source, a trustworthy source, we found certainty in the midst of chaos. And so it is for your life. You can have chaos going on around you, 
But until you have certainty in your heart, that chaos is going to infiltrate your heart. But when you find a message from a trustworthy source in the midst of chaos happening around you, you can have certainty. So when you find Christ, you find certainty in the midst of chaos. When you find a, a reliable messenger, like Luke has written this account, in the midst of chaos, when you find Christ, you find certainty in the midst of chaos. So Christ, he is the certainty in the midst of, of chaos. When you, when you encounter him, sometimes that can be in a moment, some, sometimes it can be a, a progression over months or years, like this revelation of Christ becomes true. But when you find him in the chaos that's going on in the world, in your life, when you find Christ, suddenly you find certainty. It's a trustworthy messenger that brings direction and clarity and gives you something to anchor yourself on. So this season is, is a season often is said to be the silly season, the festive season. It's a chaotic season. It, it's a time where it's impossible to get anything constructive done. And honestly, it, it's a time where some of us look forward to going to family and others of us, like this is a time of dread and a time of depression and hopelessness. And, and sometimes you look around, you see everyone else seems so happy, but, but in your life, you're not happy. And it's this wrestle and, and you cannot wait just to get through this season until like, let's just start the year again in January and, and give it another go. But if you find Christ in the midst of chaos, you find certainty. You find peace and you find something to anchor yourself upon. So this is the beginning of the Christmas story. I mean, Luke chapter 1, verse 4. I didn't get past verse 5 because verse 5 says this. We're not going to go any further than this today. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, half of verse 5. <laughs> Not even going to finish verse 5 today. In the time of Herod, king of Judea. So understand the chaos that was happening at the time where people began to find this message about Christ. The first thing you need to know about what was happening in the original Christmas story is the Roman Empire was in control of the known world. So Augustus Caesar was the ruler, and they ruled everything from Western Europe all the way to the Middle East, which included the nation of Israel. And the way that Ro Rome ruled, for those of you historians, you'll be familiar with those stories, but if you're not into history, their basic premise, their basic idea was to go in, to move in, to crush whoever was there, uh, to bring their cultures in and, and kind of infiltrate or integrate their cultures into the existing uh, societies and cultures. And the, the, the Romans had this idea of Pax Roma, which was world peace or bringing the peace of Rome. But peace for Rome wasn't... The absence of fighting, peaceful Rome was when any opponents were so weakened and crushed and obliterated that they couldn't fight back. So it was like this dominant control that came in this world system, the superpower of the known world. And uh, they, had, um, they had some uh, some good things about them in the sense that in, in the city centers, there was peace, but on the outskirts, there was chaos. So when you looked at where everybody was, like the, the people in power, there seemed to be a peace, but on the outskirts of everything, it, it was like this false sense of peace. And there was an interesting prophecy about this guy called Augustus Caesar, and he was the nephew of Julius Caesar. His name used to be Octavian before he was made Augustus Caesar. And this was found in 9 BC in Asia Minor. It's called the Priene Inscription. Now listen to this and think about what you know about the story of Jesus. So this is, not from, this is not from the Bible, but this is a historical piece of architecture, inscription, speaking about Augustus Caesar. Listen to these words. Since providence, which has ordered all things and is deeply interested in our life, has set in most perfect order by giving us Augustus. So here's this idea. Providence has given us Augustus, whom she filled with virtue, that he might benefit humankind sending him as savior, both for us and for our descendants, that he might end war and arrange all things. And since he, Caesar, by his appearance, surpassing all previous benefactors, and not even leaving to posterity any hope of surpassing what he has done, since the birthday of the god Augustus was the beginning of good tidings for the world. Doesn't that just sound so similar to like what we know about Jesus? 
So this is the idea. I mean, it, there's, there's nothing unintentional in the story of Scripture. And at the time that Jesus shows up, just before that, there's a prophecy about someone who's going to be the Savior of the world and bring world peace. But the way that Rome does it is a whole lot different to the way that Jesus does it. So you have this in mind that the looming in the background of the birth of Jesus is this world superpower, the Roman Empire, with Augustus Caesar portrayed to be a divine God whose role it is to bring salvation to the world. Except the way that they do it is through fear and control and warfare and military might, oppressing and controlling everyone in their path. So this is the backdrop, this is the backstory, the context into which Jesus the Messiah arrives. The way that the Romans operated is they would uh, appoint procurators, so people in their place who, to rule over an area. And they appointed this guy, King Herod. They made him king of the land of Judea, and Herod was of Arab descent, and he was a practicing Jew, but he wasn't a Roman. He was given Roman citizenship, but he had favor with Mark Antony and eventually with Augustus Caesar as well. So he was kind of in with the Romans, and to his own people, they, they hated him. They despised him because they saw him as a traitor because he was in with the Romans. He was putting taxes upon them, and he tried to win favor with the Jewish people by rebuilding um, roads and, and rebuilding the temple. So he, he was trying to get their buy-in, but the people were against him. The Jewish people didn't like him. Um, he was extremely cruel and suspicious. In fact, he had his own two sons and one of his wives executed because he thought they were going to steal some power from him. So he was just like this horrible, horrible guy. He's the same guy that ordered the infanticide when, when Jesus was, uh, after he'd been born. And you guys remember that story where there was a, a decree issued, like kill all the children, all the males that are under two years old, the same Herod. So this is the guy who's in power of the land. So, so see this picture. There's this evil Roman empire promising peace, but it's a false sense of peace. And then there's King Herod, and he's the puppet king of the Romans, in, and the Jewish people hate him. And then there's the Jewish people who live in the land of Judea. And, and Judea is a significant piece of land because Judea is the land that God had, had promised to the tribes of Israel, particularly the two tribes that lived in the south. And Judea is where Jerusalem is and Bethlehem is and all the, like, all the Christmas stories that we know all come out of this region. So I, I just want to paint a picture and a backdrop of, of what was going on in the time that actually this was, this was a chaotic time. I mean, imagine if, if for a moment if you were a Jewish person living then and you have the, the Romans who you hate who are putting burdens upon you. You have a, a local king who's a traitor who you hate, who's putting like financial pressures upon you, who's taking uh, everything that you have, who's oppressing you. And then on top of that, the land of Judea was promised to God's people. And uh, uh, then they moved into the land. Then they were disobedient to God. So they were exiled and people came into the land, took the land away from them, took them out of the land. And then some of them came back into the land, but it wasn't like it was before. And then all of a sudden gets to this moment where God's presence leaves the land and God ghosts them for 400 years. So God is speaking and speaking and speaking, and suddenly he's like 400 years, there's just silence. And it's into this place, into this moment in time, where as a Jewish person, I would, I would imagine you would describe things as pretty depressing, pretty hopeless, pretty chaotic, not how things were meant to be. And it's into this moment and this time that all of a sudden, angels start appearing and begin speaking of this king who's to come, and recalling the prophecies of old. And, and all of a sudden, in the midst of chaos, there's this word of certainty that speaks a better word, a preferred future, and begins to declare and decree things that are, things are about to change. So in the midst of the chaos, there's a few people who are willing to listen, a few people who are walking in the ways of God, a, a, a few people who are paying attention to what's going on, and they are the ones who suddenly have these visitations and these messengers arrive and start speaking about this, this king, this Messiah that's that's going to arrive. And the, the response of them is incredible. It's like they have this, re in the midst of chaos, they have this revelation of Christ. And their responses, suddenly they begin these prophetic songs. So over the next three weeks, we're going to take one song a week of each of these encounters and unpack these prophetic songs. As, as people in the midst of that chaos have a revelation of Jesus, something begins to come out of them and they speak promises of old, they speak a preferred future, and they speak prophetic declarations that bring about change. So for the next three weeks, we take one song a week, and, and we're going to unpack that and, and see how, how did they find Christ in the midst of chaos, and how did it bring about change. And I wanted to read to you one of the prophecies, which is quoted in one of the songs, and comes from a prophet who, who lived 800 years before this happened, and his name was Micah. And in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it says, But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, so Judah, Judea, it's the same place, 
You can read it like this. But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the, the clans of Judah. And it, this word Judah means praise. So think of this picture. Here's the, this evil Roman empire that's occupied like the world superpower. It's a picture of the, of the enemy of heaven, the forces of darkness. Has their ruler king who's oppressing God's people. He's a traitor to them. They're living in the land, which in the word Judah means praise. They're living in the land where, where God's presence was there, and then things went wrong, and suddenly God's presence is removed, and the praise is stopped. And suddenly there's a revelation of Christ, and as people encounter this message of Christ, the first thing they do is they begin to sing again, and God opens their mouths, and they begin to declare and, and begin to, to praise. And this is, this is what the prophet had said, is, though you are small, out of you will come one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. So Micah here, he's connecting the dots between the creation account and what's happening in this time when, when the angels begin to arrive to speak about Jesus, about the Christ who's coming, and, and out of the hearts come this revelation, this speaking in the midst of chaos that brings a certainty and a confidence about the way forward. All of that to say, some of you in the room, and some of you that are watching online, you're, you're facing chaotic circumstances right now. Maybe this year, like Robin said, maybe it's been a few years of chaos. Maybe it's just been in the last couple of weeks, or maybe it's even just yesterday. I, I don't know what your chaos has been, but this is what I know, is that when you find a revelation of Christ in the midst of chaos, even when there's looming superpowers over your life, where there's people that are oppressing you, where you feel like your praise has stopped in the land, where you feel like God has forgotten you and been ghosting you, perhaps like they did for 400 years, and you're wondering, have I been forgotten? It's in moments like these where God begins to speak to you and something unlocks in your heart and the praise begins to come out and you see change in your life and you find certainty in the midst of chaos. I, I don't know what your chaos is, but maybe it's, Maybe you've been battling addiction, and maybe you've, been, maybe you've been clean for like three months, and then something happened, Christmas season, just one, and suddenly you feel like you've undone all the work over the past three months, and you wonder, is there ever going to be change in my life? Maybe your chaos is you've been betrayed by someone close to you. Maybe you thought things were all good until they weren't. I don't know what your chaos is, but I know that when you find Christ in the midst of your chaos, you find certainty. Maybe your chaos is, is you just feel like, enough, enough, I'm done. I don't want to fight the same battles over again, again, again. It's been years of, of the same thing, the same pattern, the same habit again and again and again. And I'm just tired and I'm just done. I'm tired of, maybe some of you are just so tired of trying to hold everything together. And you may not use the word chaos to describe your life, but perhaps the word you would use is, is one of just, I'm completely drained. I'm exhausted. I'm finished. I'm done. I'm overwhelmed. I'm tired. I haven't got it in me to live another year. Maybe your chaos is one of, the, of a doctor's report that, that you were never expecting. And you're saying to yourself, like, I never thought this would happen to me. I know it happens to other people, but I never thought it, this would be my story. And you're reeling because of, of some things happened that's unexpected. Maybe your chaos is financial. Maybe you don't know how you're going to make it through this season, never mind even next year. Maybe you don't even know how you're going to make it through this next week or even today. Maybe your chaos is that you're, you're tired of pretending. You're carrying something in you. And you're realizing like coming to the front of the church every week is not enough to actually bring about change with what's going on in your heart. And you walk this aisle flat, getting out your chair, coming, hoping, like someone's going to pray, something's going to shift, but, but it's just, you're at the point like where, you, where you're giving up. I know what your chaos is, but I know this, that when you find Christ, you find certainty in the midst of your chaos. Because where there's uncertainty, where you don't have a bigger story, where you can't make sense of, of 
why these things are happening. If, if you find Christ, if you find his story, if he finds you, you find certainty in the midst of chaos and things begin to change. And the world can be falling apart around you, but in your heart, you can have peace. I know what your chaos is. I know what my chaos is. I know what my chaos has been. When I was young, I, I don't really remember what happened, but I, I was sexualized at a, at a very young age, and then at 12, I was exposed to pornography. And that took me down the dark road into sexual brokenness. And there was chaos in my life. But it was my chaos, it was nobody else's chaos. Because I was too scared to speak about what was going on, because I knew if I did, that there might be shame, and there might be guilt, and there might be judgment, and it would bring dishonor upon my family and my parents. I just said to myself, you know what? I'll fix this by myself. And there were moments and there were times where things seemed better, but it always came back to the same place. Like, is there ever actually going to be change or is this who I am for the rest of my life? And I self-medicated with alcohol for years to run from the feelings of, of shame and guilt because I knew what I was into was not good and was not helping and, and it, it was doing nothing good for me. But I thought and I said, and I believed the lie, like, I'll beat this, I'll beat this. No one has to know, I will beat this. Except I didn't. I lost someone close to me, someone in my family. It was a turning point for Amy and I. Before we were married, we started to go to church and, and we started to, we, we, just like you, sat in a meeting like this and, and heard the word week, week after week after week, but nothing was changing still until one moment there was... Some, something started to shift in, in my heart and I can't remember the message, but I remember the moment where God started to do something in my heart and I felt like Amy and I went home and I said, hey, we should get baptized. And this was just after we got married and it, it was like this, God was starting to find me in the midst of my chaos. And there's a bunch of people in the room who are gonna get baptized today like I did back then in 2008. It was a powerful declaration. It was a shift moment. And the, the addiction that I'd been secretly fighting in the moments when I went through the waters of baptism and I came out the other side, something shifted, something changed. And the addiction was broken in a moment. And I'm not saying that is gonna be your story. If you're gonna get baptized and you're battling addiction, it doesn't happen to everyone like that. But that God did something in me in that moment of, of stepping into what He was calling me to. Something shifted. And I came out a little different, a little change. But I still had this past. And I thought, no one needs to know about it because now I'm healed and I'm free and I'm changed and everything's, everything's good, you know, I'm going to heaven, I'm sorted. Except I wasn't because the past kept coming back into the future until one day I was sitting in church just like you and someone was preaching a message and I can't remember what they were preaching but I know God spoke to me in this moment and said, it's time to deal with the things that have gone before. I was like, God, I don't want to deal with those things. I don't want to lift the lid on that. I don't want to go back. There's too much mess. There's too much hurt. There's too much shame. Amy doesn't know about any of this stuff. Like it's going to break her if I bring it out into the light. And there was a process of me wrestling with God until the moment where Amy and I had some very, very tough and difficult conversations. And in that process, I learned about the grace of God through my wife and the grace of God for me. And we walked a journey of healing and restoration. And God found me in the midst of my chaos and I found Him and I found certainty. So I can stand here before you today and declare to you that if your life is in chaos, if you find Christ and He finds you, you will find certainty and you will walk it out. And it'll be painful and it might hurt, but here's what you don't have to worry about. Shame, guilt, judgment, condemnation, fear, anxiety, uncertainty, you don't have to worry about any of those things in the context of a local church, in this local church, in the presence of Jesus and his people, because his heart for you is to walk in freedom and to find certainty in the midst of chaos. So this church is a testament of the grace of God. It has nothing to do with Amy and I because we've said to many of you before, we are the most unlikely church planters, church leaders, people to be on church staff where it started kids ministry, the most unlikely. 
but for the grace of Jesus Christ. And your story can be, with the details different, one of the goodness and grace of God. So if your life is in chaos, maybe it's time to find Jesus. And I don't know what your decision is today. Maybe you need to respond to him to make him the Lord and Savior of your life. And we'll have a moment at the, at the end of the service to give you a chance to respond. Maybe you've made that decision and this is the moment where you're gonna take things to another level. Say, hey, I'm gonna make a public declaration of what Jesus has done in my heart. And I'm gonna to start to walk this out. So I'm gonna go through the waters of baptism in front of community, make a declaration to everyone here that my life is different because of him. And even though there's chaos in the world outside, that in him I find certainty, in him I find purpose, in him I find forgiveness and freedom and, and love. I find community, I find purpose, I find meaning. So we've got seven incredible stories to share with you. And then we're gonna baptize those seven people. And I wanna extend the invitation to you if you're here, if you follow Jesus and you haven't been baptized in water yet, we'd love to have the honor of baptizing you either in this service or you can stick around for the second service if you want a little more time to process and talk. But we've got t-shirts for you and towels and shorts and all of those kind of things. So you guys can just stay seated right where you are. But those who are getting baptized, I'm gonna ask you to just make your way over to the, your left, my right, to the front while your messages are playing. And then we're gonna put the baptisms up on screen. So you should be able to see them just from where you are. So you don't have to move around. And so the band's gonna come out and as they go through the waters, we're gonna sing and we're gonna praise and we're gonna cheer. And after that, we're gonna take a moment uh, to give you a chance to respond to whatever God is doing in your heart.